We're here today to take a look at the ASRock Z590 Tai Chi, the flagship, I think, motherboard from ASRock. But there's a couple things that you need to know. This motherboard almost makes me feel sorry for Intel, but uh, there's a couple of things. Let's, let's get started. Now first up, our test system in here is outfitted with the Cooler Master Cryo Cooler. Yeah, that's right. This is a cooler that can do sub-ambient cooling. And if you've been following the news on Rocket, uh, Rocket Lake, uh, you know, Intel's 11th generation processors, uh, they're on the 14 nanometer node, so they use a little bit more power than expected, but even at 10 nanometers, I don't think we could have expected dramatically more performance out of the Rocket Lake CPUs. The reality is that when you get a process shrink, the transistors can switch a little faster, and usually, and they're much more power efficient. So in the move from 14 nanometers to 10 nanometers, it doesn't seem like the performance and switching speed would be all that different. I mean, the Rocket Lake CPUs top out at 5.3 gigahertz. Do you think we could expect 5.6 gigahertz out of 10 nanometers? No, I don't think that's a realistic expectation at this point in time. 14 nanometers is a very mature process. Intel's really figured out a lot of things. In a shrink, not everything is shrinkable. So really, the main downside for Rocket Lake is extreme power consumption in extreme situations, which in a desktop computer, you know, how much does that really matter to you? These systems will clock up to 5.3 gigahertz and the Tai Chi can deliver over a thousand amps. This is the first time that we've seen a motherboard that theoretically has the VRM capability to deliver over a thousand amps to the CPU. Now, I didn't push CPUs that hard. We've got the i5, six core, the i9, eight core, and the i7, also eight core. The difference between the i7 and the i9 is around some of the boost algorithms and the absolute maximum clocks. I think the i5 is the best deal but the i7 is also not a terrible deal. I picked this one up at Micro Center for I think 350, 349, something like that on sale. Uh, the 10th generation CPUs are even less. Z490 versus Z590, they're cross compatible. So you could use you know, an 11th gen CPU and a Z490 board. You could use a 10th gen CPU and a Z590 board. What do you get if you combine the 11th gen CPU and Z590 that you wouldn't otherwise get? Two things. PCI Express 4, that's for the GPU, as well as an NVMe, and more PCI Express lanes to the chipset. That is the biggest thing this generation from Z590. We're finally moving from a PCI Express 4 link on the chipset to PCI Express by 8. Double the bandwidth from the CPU to the chipset. Now, if you I haven't been following my videos. This is something I talk about in almost every motherboard review for Intel CPUs going back four or five generations. It's a four gigabyte per second maximum theoretical bandwidth from the CPU to the chipset in prior generation motherboards. Fast NVMe drives uh, can easily saturate that all by themselves. We've got 10 gigabit USB, 20 gigabit USB. A lot of the time the Thunderbolt controllers also hang off of the chipset and those are also theoretically four gigabytes per second. <laughs> that, that link between the chipset and the CPU has been crowded for some time. Well, the first big change is that it's PCI Express by eight now from the CPU to the chipset. Double the bandwidth. A single NVMe is not gonna saturate that unless you're rocking a PCI Express 4 NVMe, which the chipset lanes are PCI Express 3, so it doesn't quite work that way, but you know, I digress. The other thing is Thunderbolt controllers, other USB peripherals, etc., etc. Double the bandwidth is a lot more room. But what about that PCI Express 8 NVMe? Well, you don't put it on the chipset anymore. It's wired directly into the CPU with Z590. So you've got more PCI Express lanes to the chipset. So the chipset, you know, doesn't bottleneck as bad. And then storage has its own dedicated PCI Express 4 NVMe connection. Some, but not all, Z490 motherboards will have that capability to run those PCI Express 4 NVMe directly to the chipset. The Z490 Tai Chi, for example, had that capability, but the difference from the Z490 to the Z590 is that your primary GPU slot will also run at PCI Express 4x16. You don't really get that on every single Z490 motherboard. So Z590, in my mind, is a pretty big upgrade over Z490, and in a lot of ways, long overdue. And this motherboard brings it in spades. 
Now while we're talking about Rocket Lake and power delivery before I get too far off track, this motherboard is a uh, 6 plus 2 implementation with phase doublers on the 6, so it's 12 plus 2, 14 phase power delivery. Those are 90 amp stages. Those 12 stages are based around the ISL 99930 90 amp smart power stages and the doublers are 6617A ISL phase doublers. So this is a pretty serious implementation. Like I say, it can deliver over a thousand amps to the CPU. The farthest that I've been comfortable pushing Rocket Lake has been like 450 watts for AVX 512 workloads. Although for most workloads with adaptive boost on, you're not gonna see beyond about 260, 270 watts. But still, even with this setup, the cooling for the VRM phases and the, the ISL components and the phase doublers is pretty good. There's two large heat sinks connected by a heat pipe. And the controller for all that VRM stuff is the ISL 69269. In the motherboard box, you actually get an extra auxiliary fan. I didn't find it necessary to use this. Peak temperature, according to the uh, FLIR thermal camera, was only about 72 degrees C on this motherboard, which is pretty darn good. Now, admittedly, it is 68 degrees Fahrenheit in the room here, so it is a little on the chilly side, but sides on our, uh, our fractal meshify case here, it breathes pretty well. And there is, I think, another fan sort of hidden underneath the, uh, the shroud. Uh, the IO shroud here at the back. There's also a mechanical gear. There's a moving mechanical gear that you can set options for in the BIOS in terms of like how it moves. So Hasrock's really blinged out this motherboard. Let's talk about the rear IO. So at the rear IO, we've got a BIOS flashback button, our Wi-Fi 6E antenna connections, although in the box, you only get the rubber duck antenna. So why, why? So the antennas are fixed here at the back of the case. We've got HDMI, two USB 3 ports, then we have our audio solution, which I'm gonna talk about, ESS Sabre Audio DAC. It's a pretty high-end audio implementation. Then we've got two 40 gigabit Thunderbolt ports, which also use the iGPU output. So if you wanna run iGPU multi-monitor or you can't buy a GPU right now and you just wanna run off the iGPU until you can buy a GPU, you could do that. You just need a USB-C to display port adapter or to use the HDMI out, which is you know at the rear IO. Then we've got two 10 gigabit USB ports. We've got a killer 2.5 gig NIC as well as an Intel 1 gig NIC. And then we've got two more USB 3.2 Gen 1 5 gigabit ports below that. Now by my count, that's six type A ports and optionally two type C ports for USB connectivity. I really would have liked to have had two more USB ports at the back. I think Azeroth realized that, so they bundled this in the box. This is awesome. So this is a USB 2 header to breakout. This is great for low speed peripherals, mice, keyboard, whatever. And this motherboard has a ton of connectors on it for USB. So you've got two USB 2 headers, two USB 3 5 gigabit headers, and one USB type C header, which is good for USB, uh, the two by two. So that's a 20 gigabit USB-C connection. This case doesn't do the USB-C 20 gigabit connection, but at least it didn't for my 20 gigabit peripheral. But hopefully you get a case that does. But if you don't, you can get these. You can get a breakout like this that will connect to your USB-C header and give you more USB ports at the back. Even if you're not gonna use your vertical GPU mount, you can use this. And even if you've got a fully populated system, your USB ports don't get in the way. It's a nice touch. And I'm really glad that Azrock included this so I can plug these and say, even if your motherboard doesn't include one of these, you could definitely just go buy it from somewhere because everybody's motherboard has extra headers. So let's talk for a second about memory overclocking and Rocket Lake. This motherboard, of all of the Z590 motherboards that I've tested so far, about five, has the best memory overclocking capability. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's special sauce in the firmware or special sauce in the motherboard. I haven't figured that out yet. But this is one of the few motherboards that I was able to run our i9 at 3800, DDR4 3800, one to one. And I don't even know how that's possible. And yes, I did have to loosen the uh, timings pretty loose. But it posted and I got a couple of FPS better in uh, Tomb Raider. Yeah, pretty darn good. PC Mark, things like that on Rocket Lake, it's a really good score, especially when you're using a really high speed PCI Express 4 NVMe like the Samsung 980 Pro because it's the direct connection to the CPU, it's very low latency, it's great performance. Honestly, the whole platform latency is so low that I expected way better 1080p gaming performance, especially when paired with like a 3090 or the 6800 XT, but it really wasn't dramatically different than uh, than some of the competition in the market. And I was kind of surprised by that because for productivity and things like PC Mark and you know doing the PC Mark type benchmarks, 
uh, you can get a lot more I.O. operations per second when you're using really high speed storage. And I thought that would make a bigger difference. But it's not, really, which is a little surprising. That may be something that I revisit in a future video. The cryo cooler also unlocks clock speeds beyond 5.3 gigahertz, but that's gonna be in a future video, so get subscribed if you wanna see that. The PCIe slot layout on this motherboard is pretty smart. A lot of GPUs these days are triple slot, so they move that secondary slot down. The first slot is by 16 or by eight by eight with the second slot if you're gonna run multiple peripherals. One slightly disappointing thing is if you want to run a uh, card that does bifurcation, like a two up NVMe or something like that, it does not work on the second by eight slot. This is something I've advocated for in the past, especially with Z490 because of the chipset bandwidth limitation. I think it's much less necessary to do that if you wanna run say like a RAID Zero Stripe for even more crazy disk speed because Z590 lets you plug one of those NVMe directly into the CPU. The other one you can still run off of the chipset but in the case of like the Samsung 980 you're not gonna get that PCI Express 4 speed so you would have to run it in this secondary slot. If you wanted to run say like a triple 980 configuration Theoretically, it would support it, but because you don't have bifurcation in that second slot, you can't run two X4 peripherals in the second slot while your GPU runs at X8. It's a little odd, I know. And then the bottom slot is PCI Express by four through the chipset, PCI Express 3.0. It's a pretty smart layout. And for, I think, everything except that one weirdo edge case, this is about the best layout that you can do with Z590 to make sure that you're using all of your your lanes appropriately. Oh, there's also one PCI Express by one slot in there for low speed peripheral sound card, whatever you might wanna run. And the physical placement is just above the last card. Again, I think this is just about the smartest layout that you can do for your PCI Express slots. Now for our audio implementation, yes, it's a Realtek ALC 1220, premium implementation, excellent so signal to noise ratio. It's an ESS Sabre 9218 DAC built right on the motherboard, uh, Nehemic audio, basically. So this is a really relatively high end for integrated sound uh, audio solution. You have an optical SPDIF port and then the standard gold-plated 5.1 audio jacks, and then you also have you know the front panel header with the, with the ESS Sabre audio DAC. So it's pretty reasonable in terms of a relatively high-end onboard audio solution. Knowing that Rocket Lake's gonna generate a fair bit of heat, Azrock's got you covered in terms of four pin fan headers. You've got headers at the top of the motherboard, you know, sort of near the front here, two at the rear, two at the bottom. You've got ample four pin fan connectors and lots of control software actually in the BIOS. So no matter what operating system you're running, it's basically, basically gonna work. Now in terms of Linux support, how's the Linux support on this motherboard? It's quite good. And in fact, there's a discovery. So this is running a newer BIOS than the BIOSes for the initial Rocket Lake review. And I about fell out of my chair because this is a big change with Z590 as well. The IOMMU groups have separation for the CPU lanes now. Yes, the onboard M.2 slot, the X8 slot, the primary slot, if you run it in X8 along with the other X8 slot, it breaks those apart into separate IOMMU groups. So I had separate IOMMU for the bottom X16 slot running at PCI Express by four, the middle slot running at PCI Express by eight, and the top slot running at PCI Express by eight. Now, this platform is currently limited to eight cores, but you could theoretically build a VFIO machine from this with the onboard iGPU plus two add-in GPUs, which is sort of a big deal for the Intel platform. And it was not that way for the initial uh, BIOSes that were configured on these systems from my initial testing. And further to that, there's not even an IOMMU option in the UEFI. Most people don't realize that IOMMU Auto is actually a partial enablement of IOMMU to get around uh, in, uh, compatibility problems with certain older versions of the Windows installer. So IOMMU Auto enables some IOMMU, but Enabled does full enablement and you usually get more groups between Auto and Enabled, and then Disabled, of course, disables it. Some other boards don't have an option to enable it or it's only that partial enablement, but this seems to be a full IOMMU enablement that you, when you just enable VTD, it just sort of turns it on for you. So there is a VTD option and there is an SRIOV option, which works with Nix, but not a lot of GPUs but it does have resizable bar support. So resizable bar support with the Phantom Gaming 6800 XT is a nice touch. It works really well on Rocket Lake. There's, there's, there's basically performance parity with the other platform when it comes to resizable bar related stuff. So that's exciting. 
Linux support for everything else is uh, pretty good out of the box. Of course, the Intel NIC works a little bit better than the killer NIC, but uh, Wi-Fi 6 and all this other stuff coming down the pike, the Realtek ALC 1220 audio codec, gonna remap your outputs, but it's basically completely fine out of the box, Ubuntu 20.04. So anything newer than that, you should be good to go. I do recommend kernel 5.11 or newer, however. Last and final note, Astrox really stepped up their aesthetic game. Not just the, the moving gear, but also sort of this hammered look. The motherboard box includes a little tool that, you know, is like the last couple of generations of their motherboard lets you remove it. Uh, you got three onboard M.2 slots for running whatever RAID or anything like that. So if you do want to go crazy with NVMe RAID, you can without resorting to PCIe add-in cards. Uh, all in all, ASRock has done a nice job. This is a flagship motherboard. The problem is that it's really hard for me to recommend the Intel Core i9. I think the Core i5 at around $250 US is a really good deal for what it is. And the i7, you know, I got two more cores for only like 100 bucks more. I think that's a reasonable deal, a little bit more longevity. Your strategy might be to buy the i5, and then when the you know i9 gets cheaper, you could do that. If you pick up like a 10 850K, because those are around like $300 on sale, which is crazy, that is a really good deal too. Of course, with the 10850, you don't have the dedicated PCIe lanes for your storage. You're back to using onboard storage. So if you're going to splurge for a really fast NVMe, uh, you probably don't want the 10th gen CPU. But if you're just building a normal system, I'd rather have the 10850K over the i5 11th gen any day of the week. Um, but, you know, your mileage may vary. There's a lot of edge cases and stuff we can discuss. Come to the forums at level one. I'm Wendell. I'm signing out. I'm going to play with the system, so I'll see you there.